Thank you, Dabo. Uh, thank you for these kind words. Uh, thank you all for joining. Um, uh, many, many flowers at the beginning of this talk. Um, and I think all I can say about this is that, that uh, science is about teamwork and about doing things together. And uh, I, uh, I was quite privileged to work with people like Davor and uh, many others, uh, first in Münster, where I was until 2011, and then in Birmingham, uh, where I was, as Davor said, the director of the Institute of Cardiovascular Sciences until two weeks ago, actually. And uh, now in Birmingham and in Hamburg, uh, at one of the probably one of the biggest heart centers in Europe, um, depending on how you count that. So it's my distinct pleasure to talk about the uh, genomic basis of atrial fibrillation and how this can be used to understand atrial fibrillation and maybe actually to develop ways to um, stratify or to personalize therapy. And uh, I would like to split my talk into three parts. Uh, four parts. One is I give a little introduction on personalized cardiovascular medicine and then I'll tell you uh, about the genomic basis of atrial fibrillation and both of these are things that are of interest to me but uh, I can't claim that I'm a genomic specialist or that I'm a specialist in personalized cardiovascular medicine and then I'll tell you a bit of the um, ongoing work uh, that is um, understanding the function of PITX2 in the adult left atrium and from the second part, you will hear how that actually um, relates to the genomic basis of atrial fibrillation. And then I'll talk about left atrial PITX2, BMP10, and AF ablation. And I hope that will be interesting, entertaining, and uh, potentially a bit novel for you. So why would we need personalized cardiovascular medicine? And the background to this is that cardiovascular medicine has made huge, huge progress. Uh, our mortality in of cardiovascular diseases is declining. Uh, we have not eliminated cardiovascular diseases, but we have turned acutely deadly diseases into chronic diseases that allow a very long and fulfilled life whilst having. Now, this is a picture that uh, illustrates how beautiful the heart is. This is a picture that I got from Uli Schotten, and it's in one of his review articles uh, that shows you how beautiful the right and left atria are when they are healthy. And this is a picture of a whole mouse heart. And I want to draw your attention to the uh, fine trabeculated structure of the mouse atria, both atria up here, the dark gray parts and how pretty they are, but also how complex they are. One of the reasons that I, why I felt that um, personalized cardiovascular medicine is that we actually do have a problem. Now this is data from about 10 years ago and that point in time, um, pharmaceutical companies ran about 1,700 research projects per year, but only 35 of those, but that's a very small percentage number, led to approval of new medicines. And uh, this uh, sort of mountain plot illustrates this for all areas of medicine. And you can see that number 16, that's cardiovascular medications, um, it has quite a peak in terms of R&D investment, but it's actually a trough in terms of success. The success in cardiovascular medicine was worse than in other areas of medicine. Um, area five is interesting for this talk because for some reason in this and other analyses, antiarrhythmic drugs are kept separate from cardiovascular medication. So these are antiarrhythmic drugs and you can see that there is less of investment, but it's also a bit less of a trough. Um, and the approval of drugs has gone down substantially in the years running up to 2011 when this analysis was published. So we are probably victims of our own success because we have defined broad categories of cardiology diseases, heart attack, heart failure, atrial fibrillation, and identified broad treatments that work in most of those patients. But now if we want to make further progress, we probably need to um, split those patients group, groups up further and identify smaller patient groups that allegedly have the same disease that will benefit from treatment with specific treatments. And that's what personalized cardiovascular medicine holds as a promise. And I would say it's an unfulfilled promise so far, but um, it's one that probably will fulfill its potential in the next decade or two. 
So personalized cardiovascular medicine makes clinical use of the existing and emerging knowledge on the different mechanisms of chronic cardiovascular diseases, such as atrial fibrillation, heart failure, coronary artery disease, and valvular heart disease, to define group of patients that will respond well to a given treatment. And this can be done through imaging, through biomarkers, through omics, um, or through clinical acumen. And integration of these analyses, methods, and rigorous evaluation of personalized medicine and clinical trials are probably required to bring this promising concept to fruition. And this is from the ESC textbook in cardiovascular medicine, by the way. Now, when we look at atrial fibrillation, there are a few things that have been known since the Middle Ages that will lead to a healthy life and also prevent atrial fibrillation. And they include a certain amount of physical activity, not too little, but also not too much, a balanced diet, sufficient sleep, moderate alcohol consumption, and avoiding abnormal stress. And in the 19th century, because we suddenly had all access to tobacco, we had to add not to smoke. We actually have quite a few treatments for cardiovascular diseases that also prevent atrial fibrillation to some extent. They uh, range from interventions such as weight loss to common cardiovascular treatments such as antihypertensive therapy or even statins, but also then to antiarrhythmic drugs or complex interventions such as AF fibrillation and valve surgery. We apply those typically to um, treat patients for the underlying conditions that also predispose atrial fibrillation, but they do have a certain effect on um, preventing atrial fibrillation and or preventing the complications of atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation has many causes, and some of them are listed here, and this is from a publication that was generated by an EU consortium uh, that finished its work nominally last year. And, we, and you've all heard about them. They relate to atrial fibrosis, abnormal calcium homeostasis, iron channel dysfunction, autonomic dysfunction, oxidative stress, dysregulation through to microRNA or paracrine fat cell activity. And you could add probably 10 or 20 other mechanisms to that disease. Interestingly though, we don't consider those disease mechanisms when we decide on treatment for atrial fibrillation. And, when you, and this is a list that is a rough summary of the current AF guidelines. And it basically says, well, look, you treat concomitant conditions and that applies to all patients. When you decide on anticoagulation, you pick a few clinical risk factors, uh, for example, the chats mask score. And when it comes to rhythm control therapy, you basically pick your treatment based on AF pattern, but really on safety. When you look at real world data, this is an analysis of uh, over 100 hospitals uh, that are um, uh, US hospitals. And it looked at all patients that were initiated on antiarrhythmic drug therapy in those um, hospitals in a certain defined um, range of years. And the researchers found that there are hardly any um, patient factors outside of heart failure maybe that would determine which antiarrhythmic drug was chosen. But the biggest factor that influenced the choice of treatment was the site. So it's really the local protocol that says, we use antiarrhythmic drug A, let's say flecainide, or we use antiarrhythmic drug B, let's say sotrolol, or in even other centers not captured in this analysis, we will offer AF ablation earlier. And when you look at this from a patient perspective, that is not really a satisfying concept that depending on which hospital you go to, you get a different treatment. So I think there's a lot to be said about personalizing or stratifying rhythm control therapy based on what's going on in the atrial cardiomyocytes and in the atrium. And if we had clinical markers that would tell us what's going on in the atria, we could actually devise um, treatment algorithms that would reflect disease mechanisms and target them. So that's sort of the background of personalized cardiovascular medicine, particularly for rhythm control. Now, what do we know about the genomic basis of atrial fibrillation? Now, my history is partially a history of someone who has an interest in inherited arrhythmia syndromes, things like the long QT syndrome, Rugado syndrome, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And we've 
known for quite a while that rare genetic variants, mutations in patients that cause these diseases also lead to atrial fibrillation. We know that atrial fibrillation is present in patients who have long QT syndrome, Brugada syndrome, or CPVT. We know that it's also quite common in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. There are more recent data that show that it's also present in patients with ARVC. And there are some early genetic findings that show that defective ANP signaling is associated with atrial fibrillation and heart failure. Similarly, rare genetic variants in the same gene groups have been identified by um, sequencing studies in more recent years, for example, in sarcomeric genes, but also in genes such as LAMI. Now, this only captures a few percent of the patients with atrial fibrillation who have these rare genetic variants, these rare inherited cardiomyopathy. And my watershed moment in terms of the uh, genomic basis of atrial fibrillation was the publication of this paper in 2007 coming from Iceland. Uh, the first population that was fully characterized genomically in the world and that identified two common gene variants located on chromosome 4q25 um, close to a gene called PITX2 as the genomic signal that is associated with atrial fibrillation. Um, these are figures from that uh, paper. The risk increase, the relative risk increase of uh, patients with the risk variant wasn't that big. It was about 50%, but it was by far the strongest signal, the first signal that these researchers picked up. And the uh, variants they are depicted here uh, were located about 150 kilobases upstream of the closest gene, which is the PITX2 gene. I'll get to the meaning of PITX2 in a minute. Now, this is a graph that I took from a WhatsApp chat of my cardiology colleagues here in Birmingham, and uh, it's got nothing to do with atrial fibrillation, but I thought it would be helpful. It illustrates in an exponential way the likelihood of us looking at exponential graphs in the last two months, and it reflects on how we all have been become used to looking at exponential graphs through exposure to the COVID-19 pandemic. I have that here because the next graph that I show you has an exponential y-axis. Um, so this is a more, this is 10 years later, and this is an analysis of all the gene variants that are associated with atrial fibrillation in a much larger population. This is about 65,000 people with AF and about 100,000 controls. And you see that the strongest signals are still on chromosome 4q25 close to the PITX2 gene. And there are about 30, maybe 50 other variants. Now, the important bit of this graph is actually the y-axis. This is a y-axis that is given in a logarithmic scale. So each increase from 1 to 2 increases by 10 to the power of 1. And it goes up to 500. And the y-axis is disrupted here. So the uh, association of AF with variants chromosome 4q25 in this analysis is 10 to the power of 470 higher than in its p-value than the associations are of all the other variants and you can really only find these variants when you have very high numbers of patients. What I'm trying to tell you is that by far the strongest association between AF and the genomic risk is, is located on chromosome 4q25 about 150 kilo basis upstream of PITX2. The variant that was described first is also, has also been tested in much smaller cohorts and has been associated with recurrent atrial fibrillation in patients who undergo AF ablation, patients on antiarrhythmic drugs, interestingly with some variation between the drugs, patients who underwent cardioversion, and even predicting post-operative atrial fibrillation after open heart surgery. So somehow this reflects a common mechanism, both of AF, but also of recurrent AF. Now, how can we imagine that this is going to happen? PITX2 encodes for a transcription factor. And what's likely, and there are actually some data now that suggest this, is that um, the risk variant changes the binding of transcription factors up to, uh, to the DNA and thereby changes the uh, 
um, reading of a gene that is in close proximity to those uh, to the risk alleles and thereby changes gene expression in the atrium and that was sort of the hypothesis that uh, we tried to follow when we decided soon after this first paper came out in 2007 that we wanted to understand what's the function of PITX2 in the adult left atrium. Now there are others who did this way before us. PITX2 has been studied by developmental biologists for decades. It encodes for the paired-like homeodomain transcription factor 2 or pituitary homeobox factor 2. This is a factor that binds to DNA, regulates gene expression and is known in the prenatal phases of life to promote leftness of the heart, lung and aortic arch and to suppress the left-sided formation of sinus nodes. Complete deletion of PITX2 in mice leads to intrauterine death and the formation of uh, sinus nodal-like structures in the left atrium um, in embryos, as you can see in this elegant picture from a very good paper, from a very good set of papers that came from the group of Vincent Christoffels in Amsterdam. So that it appears that PITX2 is somehow responsible for maintaining leftness of the left atrium. Now, what is the function of PITX2 in the adult heart? Um, we did a small study comparing gene expression patterns in wild-type mouse atria, both left and right, um, at different ages and of different um, uh, uh, genetic backgrounds, but only wild-type mice in the first instance. And we found that PITX2 is actually the single most differentially expressed left atrial gene, similar to its right atrial equivalent called bone morphogenetic protein 10. Now keep that in mind because it will come back later. We verified this with um, uh, RT-PCR. The first analysis was based on gene chips. And you can see that uh, PITX2 again is highly expressed in the left atrium, but not in the right. And BMP10 opposite, highly expressed in the right, but not in the left. You can also verify this on the protein level, but you find that the differences in protein are much smaller and that is typical for transcription factors that actually act uh, at the DNA or RNA level as well as on the protein level. We actually found the same thing also in a small number of human left atria. When you look at this in more systematically, uh, this is from one of our first papers on PITX2 deficient mice, you find that this left-right gradient of PITX2 is present both in um, mouse atria, here's the right atrium and the left atrium, and for comparison, skeletal muscle, a tissue that's known to highly express PITX2, and here is the same in the human atrium. Again, you see a logarithmic scale. Uh, of these data, but it's a log two, so it's uh, uh, two to the power of two, not to the power of ten. And we find similar changes of the same genes that we identified in um, mice when we look at uh, gene expression in human atria. And this is a list of left atrial and potentially PITX2 control genes, and I just want to draw your attention to one a gene that we found quite interesting and that is called DDIT4L. And that's a PITX2 control gene, both by testing um, PITX2 deficient atrial tissue, but also by looking at the correlation between PITX2 mRNA and DDIT4L RNA in atrial tissue in man. And the correlation is maintained when we only look at cardiomyocytes. PITX2 heterozygous deficiency so deleting only one allele of the PITX2C gene, which is the cardiac isoform of PITX2, leads to a higher propensity for inducible atrial fibrillation in mice. This is a uh, recording of the figure from our paper, but others have published the same thing. So that is a very consistent finding across different mouse models. And these mice have normal conduction velocity. This is shown here by contact mapping, but has been verified by others using optical mapping as well. And the mice have a normal structure of the atria when you look at it through echocardiography, looking at atrial function and size, um, looking at atrial histology, and also, as I said, looking at optical mapping. 
So there aren't many signs for structural damage in the atria at the time when they have this propensity to atrial fibrillation. But they do have a shorter action potential duration. And the first findings were um, reported using monophasic action potentials in the um, isolated beating mouse heart uh, technique that we have developed over the years. And again, that has been validated later on. About three years later, uh, the group of Jim Martin um, reported that uh, increasing the expression of PITX2 in the left ventricle protects um, against infarct ischemia induced damage. And that this has, uh, and that PITX2 has a role in the antioxidant response after ischemia. And that may be interesting when we think about the left atrium as a part of the heart that is under chronic strain and that may actually operate at um, a situation that is near hypoxia. An ongoing project that we are uh, continuing in Birmingham is actually looking at the similarities between chronic intermittent hypoxia and PITX2 deficiency for atrial function. Now we took this further and tried to understand how this could affect um, the propensity to atrial fibrillation, but also the response to arrhythmic uh, drugs. When you look at cellular action potentials, you find that PITX2 deficiency shortens the action potential, as I told you before, but also depolarizes the resting membrane potential. Not by, um, not by much, by about two to three millivolts, but it is a clear uh, and significant effect. Um, and it probably has to do with task currents, as you can hear see in this slightly complex um, patch clamping uh, slide, where we find a reduction in the background potassium currents in PITX2 deficient isolated cardiac myocytes that we believe is the reason for the depolarization of the resting membrane potential. Interestingly, um, this reduced background current that leads to a depolarized resting membrane potential also enhances the effectiveness of sodium channel blockers, for example, flecainide, in preventing recurrent AF. So that the same functional change that may predispose these atria to atrial fibrillation also protects them better against recurrent atrial fibrillation when they are exposed to sodium channel blockers. And you can read details of that finding in a paper that we published in Jack four years ago. So I see five questions here. Miao Chui asked, how is the atrial expression of PITX2 compared to its, ex its expression in ventricles? Uh, PITX2 is almost non-detectable in uh, ventricular tissue under normal conditions. PITX2 expression is increased in acute ischemia to some extent. Um, but if you take a normal heart, PITX2 is a perfect marker for left atrial tissue and is hardly detectable, really at the limit of detectability using qPCR in all the other three heart chambers. Olga Ruzieka asked, what's the function of PITX2 in skeletal muscle? And I have to pass on that one. Um, I can't really tell you, I'm not a skeletal muscle expert. Um, and Mike Shattuck wrote a very nice comment. Well, I like it because it starts with very nice talk. I have to read that out to you. Um, and um, Mike asks, how important is this in a clinical context where most people have uh, concomitant diseases and whether the anatomy and the structural damage that our hearts incur during our lifetimes are more important. And um, I think in fairness, the answer is uh, that if you compare clinical risk scores for developing atrial fibrillation with genomic risk scores for developing atrial fibrillation, they are comparable. So the um, risk ratio that you get when you combine all the genomic findings is actually not that different from the risk ratios that you combine when you get all the clinical findings, and that includes imaging. And it conveys different information. So if you combine a genomic risk score with a clinical risk score, you actually get a better prediction of atrial fibrillation. So, and I think the other part of that thinking is that um, 
the genomic AF risk is probably not like an, a mutation where you have the mutation and then you get the disease, but it's more a predisposing factor. And it may well be that um, the risk alleles on chromosome 4Q25 that I now think regulate PITX2 interact with concomitant factors, with diseases, with age to lead to atrial fibrillation development. So I think it's a bit of both um, and it's still early days because we've worked with clinical factors for a long time, but it actually conveys quite a significant amount of clinical information. Um, there is one, oh, Rodolf Fischmeister asked about um, uh, FGF23 and how its main target is the kidney and um, how we explain that it is a biomarker for atrial fibrillation. Um, and Rodolf, you're completely correct. FGF23 has a main effect in the kidney and it's actually exponentially, uh, the word exponentially comes back in this talk, increased in um, patients with chronic kidney disease, particularly at later stages. And there may be some thought in there that could, whether FGF23 can explain the clinical association between kidney disease and atrial fibrillation. But FGF23 is one of the um, biomarkers or one of the regulators of the hypertrophic response to the heart. And there are now decent data, both in knockout mice and in patients that show that FGF23 promotes the hypertrophic response and leads both to physiological and pathological cardiac hypertrophy. And I think that this is one of the possibilities why FGF23 could be a biomarker for atrial fibrillation. And, and Paulus, if I may add, I mean, there's also some decent data on fibrosis as well coming yeah. up slowly. So, yeah, and oh yeah, and there's actually a wonderful recent review article in uh, JAK <laughs> by a PhD student of Davos called Jonathan Law. Um, he can't join today probably because he's pulled back into full-time NHS work, but it gives you an overview of um, uremic cardio cardiomyopathy and how that could be linked to FGF23. A lot of that is. Uh, currently speculation and we need more data for this but the knockout mouse data are quite clear and as you say Davo they lead to hypertrophy and to fibrosis. Um, uh, Thomas Eschenhagen, hi Thomas, asked whether um, we could find a correlation between the um, uh, gene uh, status so the uh, genomic AF risk and PITX2 concentrations in the atrial tissues that we have. And um, the short answer is uh, the correlation is not as linear as we want it to be. And, uh, but we think that this is due to the fact that PITX2 um, is uh, produced in response to different ambient stimuli, including ischemia. Um, but there are now two publications that show that if you um, delete the region in which the um, uh, common gene variants sit, you find a reduced expression of PITX2. So there is now, there's a, it's a, one of them is a PNAS paper from Jim Martin's group from last year that shows that if you knock out the um, region where the SNPs sit or its homolog equivalent uh, in mice, you find a reduced expression of PITX2. So I think in short, uh, our, my thinking is that PITX2 is in a healthy situation regulated by these SNPs, but in pathological situation, and almost all of the um, atrial tissues that we have are taken in a period of acute stress uh, during an open heart procedure or during a thoracoscopic AF ablation, PITX2 is regulated by other factors as well. And Marie Jose Gumans asks about BMP9 and uh, and correctly remarks that BMP10 and BMP9 come out as dimers and form dimers. Um, we have not quantified BMP9, and uh, we have, but we've been in touch with people who have worked on BMP9 and BMP10 a lot. Uh, there are some data to show that a reduced BMP10 or BMP9 concentration is associated with pulmonary artery hypertension. So far, we are not aware of any cardiac condition that is associated with increased BMP10 levels. We have not looked at BMP9 because it doesn't seem to be produced in the heart, it's produced in the liver. 
but we would assume that some of the concentrations or some of the BMP10 molecules that we detect are actually in dimers. Lucy Carrier asks, oh my God, this is never ending. Uh, hello, Lucy, great that you're around. Um, she asked that BM, whether we have proof that BMP10 expression is directly regulated by PATX2 or is it just an association? Well, this comes back to the topic of uh, exponential graphs that I showed you in the middle of the uh, presentation. Uh, if we hadn't had the lockdown, we would have the data now. So we are looking at factors such as BMP10 in um, atrial cardiac myocytes that have reduced um, PITX2 levels. We have data from mouse cardiomyocytes or from mouse atria that illustrate this. And I've shown them in one of the slides. I won't go back now, but basically we see that BMP10 is elevated by quite a bit, both at the RNA and at the protein level in um, atria of PITX2C or PITX2 deficient mice. But we would like to see direct data. So sort of having an intervention that reduces PITX2 in cells and then look at BMP10 levels. We have planned those experiments, but we were uh, we had to pause that, and I'm sure we'll get those data once we are all back in our labs. By the way, Paulus, please feel free to stop whenever you feel like, you know, so <laughs> you can okay. please, please keep going but if you want to. But I, mean, I'm, I'm, I don't know. I think when, when people are, I mean, I always learn most from questions and answers. So uh, uh, I definitely want to read all the answers, and I'll, I'll see whether I can maintain <laughs> enough of a sharp mind to answer them. No, thank you. We appreciate um, your time. Uh, okay. And Grace Muller asks about uh, whether what I think is the mechanism or the driving force that explains the PITX2 correlation with AF. I think it is a, an a ion channel dysfunction in cardiac myocytes that are depleted of PITX2. And that's what the data that we currently have suggests. Um, it's ba mainly based on mouse data. Um, and then Grace also asks about uh, changes in STK11 or LKB1, which is one of the genes that when knocked out in mice uh, causes spontaneous atrial fibrillation. We will look into that, Grace, but my simple comment is that um, I've seen quite a few mouse models with spontaneous atrial fibrillation. We've published on a few in the past. Uh, they, they almost inevitably have uh, marked structural changes in the atria because a normal mouse atrium doesn't sustain atrial fibrillation. And therefore, uh, we will check that and we can do that in our gene expression data sets. I don't have the answer, but I wouldn't be surprised if the mechanisms are different because typically, a mouse model that develops spontaneous atrial fibrillation has uh, marked alterations in the atrial structure and size. And Yi Kuang Zhang asks whether we have any insight into PITX2 regulating ex extracellular matrix content or interaction with fibroblasts. Um, I think the short answer is no. That's an interesting question. But so far, our data suggests that the PITX2 that is found in cardiomyocytes is more important. So I would think that the majority of the effect is linked to um, PITX effects in cardiomyocytes themselves. But of course, I can't rule out other um, effects. Mukesh Lalvani asks whether we know more about the 4Q25 locus and whether it codes for any non-coding RNA or epigenetic enhancer. Now, I'm not the expert in this. I've, we've basically taken this first Nature publication in 2007 and looked for the no knockout mice. And this was a big leap of faith at that point in time. And there are still some elements of the chain that link the um, common gene variants to PITX2 that haven't been fully explored. Um, but there are a few papers that suggest that there is a long non-coding RNA that um, could regulate gene expression that is located in that area. And there is good data now to show that the region that is affected by the common gene variants is an enhanced region that will affect the PITX2 locus, including knockout experiments and including um, uh, remote gene association studies. Um, and Svetlana Riley asks whether there are other 
genes encoded um, in that gene desert close to those SNPs? And the short answer is yes. And one of the other candidate genes that has been interrogated is NPEP. Um, and there are some data to suggest that NPEP may have a role in atrial fibrillation and that NPEP expression is associated with the risk alleles. Um, but I think it's much less um, convincing overall. Uh, but obviously, it's entirely possible that the um, association between the um, enhancer effect of uh, those uh, common gene variants does not only affect PITX2, but also other transcription factors or other regulatory genes. Well, thank you. I, oh, actually, now we've got another question just come in from Emiliano from Brazil. Oh, okay, good. Do, 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 do. I'm just looking at the chat. There's also a question in the, in the chat from yeah, Roman Tijamiro, but... Well, uh, let me know, so let's see. So Roman Tick Morimov asks about the potential of microRNAs as biomarkers for AF. Um, and I have to admit, I've only recently become a convert into biomarker research, so uh, others may know more about this. But a few things are worth keeping in mind for any biomarker. Uh, you want a biomarker that is stable under normal conditions, so that doesn't change over time. And quite a few of the microRNAs see some changes, at least in the literature that I know. You also want a biomarker that is ideally specific for the disease process, or at least for the organ that you are studying. Some of the microRNAs that have been published are heart specific, and some of them may actually be atrial specific. Um, but in terms of the disease process, I think we need to work a lot more to understand this. So I think this is it's possible that we end up with microRNAs as biomarkers for AF, but um, I think we are much further upstream on the road towards a biomarker compared to the um, plasma proteins that I've spoken about. I think that covers most of the questions as far as I can see them. So there's one question that's just ah. coming from Emiliano at the oh, bottom. Yeah. Ah, so. Emiliano, you are asking whether we observed any changes on ventricular action potential or ventricular arrhythmias in PITX2 mice changes on ECG. I can comment on the ECG. Uh, we didn't see any changes there. Um, we have only done a limited number of experiments with ventricular pacing protocols. The main reason being that PITX2 is not expressed in wild type mice in the ventricles. So we didn't expect many changes when we knock out PITX2 and reduce the amount from zero to, or close to detection limit to a bit less. Um, so uh, we don't have complete proof. And I think it's an interesting question, um, but there is hardly any PITX2 in, in ventricular tissue at baseline. Um, that completely changes in the response to acute um, injury, for example, a myocardial infarction but I would like to point to the excellent Nature paper from Jim Martin's group on that. Uh, they've done really amazing work on looking at the signaling of PITX2 in acute ischemia in ventricles. But in normal hearts, it's just not there, and therefore reducing it will probably not change the phenotype a lot. No. Well, well done, Paulus. I mean, that's, uh, <laughs> you've answered every single question, so that's quite, a, quite, a, quite a, an impressive feat in itself. <laughs> Um, so, first of all, thank you, Paolo, for your time. I mean, and a wonderful, wonderful webinar. I, I mean, I've enjoyed it, and I'm, I'm sure everyone else did. You've got a lot of compliments here. So, uh, I would just like to advertise, just take a second of your time, and just to advertise one more time um, tomorrow's talk. So, and tomorrow's talk is actually a really interesting talk. Uh, it's not going to have a lot of scientific content, I suspect, but it raises a, a really important question. By Professor David Eisner, and uh, the talk will be on Does the System Reward Fraud? So, same time tomorrow, uh, a talk by Professor David Eisner from the University of Manchester. And again, I would just like to thank the ISHR for all their support. And of course, I'm going to stop sharing now. And uh, I would like to thank Paulus once again for all the time that you've given us and for really wonderful science. <laughs>
Well, thank you, Davo, for hosting this. I'd like to thank all the people who uh, helped do the work and who actually did the work that I was privileged to present today. And I hope that you'll find some of the unpublished stuff in press soon. Thank you all for listening. This was good fun. I really enjoyed it. And stay safe. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone.